The golden rule of storytelling, show, don't tell. Any important event in a story needs to be shown to the audience. That event just doesn't hold any weight if all you do is tell people about it. As it just so happens, Hodgepodge Kojimi Hat is the master of telling players about something instead of showing it to them. Did you like it? No sir, I didn't like it. By now you should be aware that the boss is a terribly written character. I know you're not, but you should. Oh, you're disliking the video already? Like I give a f She's the writing equivalent of a dumpster fire. Why? Because we never see the development of the relationship between her and Nakey Snakey. We're just expected to play along when the game tells us that this person's important. As bad as she is though, Police Knots is so much worse! In that game, all you get is a wedding photo, and that's supposed to be a substitute for character development. Then literally two minutes after you meet the person in the photo, they get blown up, and they play this dramatic music like you're supposed to care, but the main character spends the rest of the game trying to bang his own daughter. Listen to me, 94% of Google users are trash. The reason I bring any of this up is that Jokima's games all have a major problem of telling you what you're supposed to feel instead of putting the work in to make you. Once again, I gotta remind people of what happens at the end of MGS2. After he had been lied to his entire life, Raiden decides he's not gonna believe everything he's told, and he's gonna start thinking for himself. But that message wasn't meant for just Raiden. That's what the players were supposed to do. But nobody did that. I sure as hell didn't, and that's why the series kept going for 14 years longer than it should have. This brings us to the most pivotal figure in the Metal Gear saga, who also happens to be the one person a lot of people are quick to judge without so much as a second thought. Big Boss is portrayed as this evil psycho warlord, but we only ever hear about his war crimes from secondhand sources. We never actually see him being the terrorist he's made out to be. In both Peace Walker and MGS5, you get bonus hero points when you take enemies out non-lethally, but if you kill even a single person during a mission, that bonus is forfeit. That's the game telling you that the optimal and correct way to play is by saving lives instead of taking them. Aside from that, in every single game where you play as Big Boss, you're trying to save the world from a global catastrophe. At no point in the Metal Gear Saga do we ever experience the heinous acts he committed. We're just told about them and expected to take that knowledge at face value. That's not good enough. If Big Boss is supposed to be a super badass terrorist, there needs to be a hell of a lot more evidence for that than what we got. I tell you what, let's go through some of the crimes Big Boss allegedly committed to see just how bad he really was. We'll start off with torture, the one act of villainy we actually see Big Boss participating in. Even though it wasn't the real Big Boss, Venom was still acting as B-Dub's proxy. And since the real Big Boss took advantage of the doppelganger that Zero made for him, that means Big Boss was complicit in every action that Venom Snake took. When it comes to torture though, the Metal Gear series keeps things extremely kiddie friendly. Seriously. In order to secure Peace Walker at 15 and up rating in Japan, the electrocution scene was changed so that Strangelove tries to extract information by tickling Snake to death. <laughs> the NSA is going to flag me for saying this, but torture by electrocution is kind of weak. I mean, the victim suffers no long-term damage, they're not disfigured in any way. Sure, there might be some psychological effects, but as we see throughout the series, people regularly walk away from being electrocuted like it ain't no thing. You call this torture? A lot of you guys don't know about Berserk, and it shows. Despite that, the use of torture in any form is still a crime that Big Boss is guilty of. That's why Quiet thanks him for the torture with gratuitous fan service at every possible opportunity. Now if MGS5 was just a straight up revenge tale like it was supposed to be, then the torture scenes we see in the game would be downright evil, full stop. But that's not what it was. For whatever reason, the Diamond Dongs were made to save billions of people from being infected by the world's deadliest biological weapon. So I'm not really concerned about Ocelot Hyper extending this dude's leg, because one, his dumbass deserved it, and two, it was a means to an end. If one stupid ass plant girl has to get electroshock therapy so the so-called free world can keep speaking English, well. It is what it is. Next up, kidnapping. In 1995, Outer Heaven agents abducted Dr. Drago Madnar and his daughter to force him to build the Metal Gear Model TX-55. Not only that, but Madnar served as an important hostage, ensuring any nation that wanted to destroy Outer Heaven couldn't just bomb the place to hell. And then I guess Dr. Madnar came down with a severe case of Stockholm Syndrome because four years later, Doc Mad defected to Zanzibar land of his own free will so he could give Big Boss the D. Metal Gear D. Get your mind out of the gutter. 
Now, it's true that Dr. Madnar and his daughter were forcibly taken hostage during the Outer Heaven uprising, but something Big Boss said convinced the good doctor that Outer Heaven was a good idea. Madnar was so passionate about making Zanzibar into an economic superpower that he helped Big Boss kidnap his colleague, Dr. Keo Marv. But when Marv didn't give up his formula for I can't believe it's not petroleum, Madnar killed him. Madnar even tried to kill Snake before his spine was blown to pieces by a few remote-controlled missiles, an event he somehow survived, but whatever. Quick sidebar. Soon after MGS4 was released, Konami launched the Metal Gear Solid 4 database, an official encyclopedia that contained information on every piece of canon in the series, including portable ops. More on that in a future video. Since MGS4 was a lot of people's first experience with the franchise, the database was necessary to bridge any gaps in people's understanding. The database is full of inaccuracies and contradictions, which goes to show you that nobody who worked on the series knows the story 100%. But still, as of 2008, the database was the only official resource we had for information about the canon. So I want to direct your attention to the article about Dr. Petrovich Madnar, where it clearly says that he resurrected Big Boss with cybernetics after the downfall of Outer Heaven. But that information wasn't just made up for the database, that comes directly from a rumor that Kassler tells you in Metal Gear 2. The point is, we already had an official explanation for why Big Boss survived Outer Heaven. Yeah, it was a cheesy B-movie explanation, but Metal Gear 2 was a cheesy B-movie game that nobody outside Japan even played until 16 years after it came out. So what the hell is this? Why did we need this? Anyway, kidnapping, torture, yeah, they're pretty bad, I guess, right? But unlike Dr. Madnar, Big Boss never killed anybody in cold blood. Time to ramp things up. I'm getting a little bored. Let's talk about child soldiers. Won't somebody please think of the children? Aw oh, yeah. Them Kojanki stands have been waiting for me to talk about this one. There they go. In the comments section as usual, mouthing off about some shit they got no clue about. You can hear them just foaming at the mouth they want to shove this in my face so bad. A lot of people out there think Big Boss deployed child soldiers to the battlefield, but did he actually do that? Commander Riker, let him know. It never happened. It never happened. It's false. It never happened. That's right. At no point in his life did Big Boss ever employ child soldiers. Solidus actually did, though. And since he's genetically identical to Big Boss, doesn't that... I mean... Because technically... Never mind. As we see in MGS5, Venom goes out of his way to keep children safe from harm. But people think something happens between 1984 and 1999 that makes Big Boss change his policy. After analyzing Metal Gear's storyline for so many years, I've had several discussions about Big Boss's status as the de facto villain of the series, and every time the subject of child soldiers is brought up, people are quick to reference this conversation from Metal Gear 2. You saw those children, didn't you? Everyone is a victim of a war, somewhere of the world, and they'll make fine soldiers in the next war. Start a war, fan its flames, create victims, then save them, train them, and feed them back onto the battlefield. To be perfectly clear, Big Boss's plan to create victims of war is an undeniably shitty thing to do, and I'll get to that, but we're specifically talking about child soldiers. Big Boss said those children would make fine soldiers in the next war, as in when they were old enough to make that decision for themselves. But while they were still children, they wouldn't be allowed anywhere near a battlefield. Now, Big Boss did say he was gonna train the victims of war that he created, but he never specified when. For the sake of argument though, let's say he meant he was going to train the victims as children and not when they decided to join the military after they came of age. If that's the case, why don't you ever see the Zanzibar kids running drills or working on their marksmanship? Why don't they open fire when they spot you? Probably because they're too busy playing tag, catching bugs, eating chocolate, and doing other general kid stuff. What the hell? That's a better childhood than I ever got. I thought these were supposed to be victims of war, and they're out here having the time of their lives. But even if Big Boss was preparing children for military service, that's not a crime. It's morally suspect, but it's not against the law. If you think it is, I'm guessing you've never heard of the Junior Reserve Officer Training Corps programs active in high schools and middle schools throughout the United States. And other countries around the world have similar programs specifically designed to enlist children in the armed forces as early as possible. So if simply training a kid for battle equates to employing child soldiers, check this out. If you played any military-themed video game that featured real-world weapons or tactics before you were old enough to join the armed forces in your country, congratulations. You too were a child soldier. Some people might argue that Big Boss was guilty of child endangerment since he allowed those children to play in an active war zone with no supervision. If that's the case, then in any country with a standing army, children are in danger if they play outside. A nation doesn't become a battlefield until it's invaded by another country. 
In the event of a large-scale invasion, like any other nation, Zanzibar would have had protocols in place to shelter or evacuate any children or civilian contractors. And actually, they did have supervision. Uncle Ocelot was there the whole time. By now, hopefully we can put the child soldiers issue to rest. It should be pretty clear that Big Boss would never put an innocent child in danger. But he did say he was going to create war orphans so his army would have a constant supply of misguided kids with chips on their shoulders. My only question is, when exactly did he plan on doing that? What was he waiting for? Because as of 1999, Big Boss had created absolutely zero victims. The Zanzibar kids you see running around aren't orphans of Big Boss's own making, they're rescues. And some of those kids came from the original Outer Heaven. After Outer Heaven's self-destruct sequence went off, NATO did eventually bomb the hell out of the place just to be 100% sure. In the aftermath, Big Boss personally dug through the rubble to save as many lives as he could. Now why would somebody who's planning on engulfing the world in endless warfare go out of his way to save the life of a war orphan? In Big Boss's perfect world, there would have been no shortage of orphans to brainwash, so why did he feel the need to save those particular children? Keep in mind, Big Boss was on the other side of the planet at Foxhound HQ while Venom was getting jibby with it. After the bombs went off, he didn't ask one of his mercenaries to do it for him, he flew to South Africa himself so he could personally save as many lives as possible. And 30% of people believe this man is evil. Just think about that for a second. B -b but he said he was gonna create victims and feed them back onto the battlefield. And, and you believed him? Just because he said it? All right, check this out. If you don't like the video and subscribe, then there's a 97% chance that you're gonna grow moose antlers out of your ass. As I mentioned, I've had this discussion about Big Boss's crimes against humanity before. And after I shoot down everybody's arguments like I just did, people point to one last thing that cements Big Boss as an evil mastermind, the fact that he possessed weapons of mass destruction. So let's get into it. According to the backstory of Metal Gear 2, by the late 90s, all the countries of the world had somehow agreed to completely dispose of all their nuclear weapons. Soon after Zanzibar Land was founded, mercenaries raided nuclear disposal sites around the world and stole all the warheads that hadn't been destroyed yet. So Zanzibar became the only country on the planet with nuclear weapons. Big Boss had achieved a complete global monopoly on nuclear weapons. To what end? Did he have compulsive hoarding disorder, but for nukes? Again, what was he waiting for? In a real hostage scenario, when the bad guys feel like things aren't going their way, you know what they do? They start executing hostages. In this case, Big Boss was holding the entire world hostage with nuclear weapons. You'd think that after Solid Snake blew up a helicopter inside the fortress, Big Boss would have stopped playing games. But he didn't, because he never had any intention of firing a nuke. He only wanted the governments of the world to think he did. Here's something else you might not have considered. If the great powers of the world decided to dispose of all their nukes at the same time, you might think that'd be a good thing. But how easy do you think it would be for there to be a logistics issue, or for a couple units to go missing? It would be tremendously easy because this kind of thing happens all the time. So all complete disarmament would really do is tank the black market price of stolen warheads. We're talking a straight up buy two, get some free, fire sale type scenario. So by stockpiling and safeguarding all the warheads that had yet to be disposed of, Big Boss prevented corrupt bureaucrats from selling to any ragtag terrorist cell that was trying to score a nuclear weapons arsenal on the cheap. So once again, Big Boss was saving the species from a global disaster. Obviously, any kind of threat should always be taken seriously and acted on. The fact that Big Boss said he was going to subject the world to never-ending warfare is enough to warrant military intervention. Regardless of his true intentions, Big Boss had to be stopped. I'm with you on that. But I think it's kind of short-sighted to say that this man who we constantly see sacrificing himself for the sake of the innocent just suddenly went insane and decided to blow up the planet. After studying and analyzing these games for the past 22 years, it's abundantly clear to me that there's only one word to describe someone as selfless, benevolent, and altruistic as Big Boss. And it sure as hell isn't evil. I'm gonna say it again, the golden rule of storytelling is show, don't tell. In other words, actions speak louder than words. So what actions did Big Boss take that made him into the super badass terrorist everyone thinks him to be? The answer is... nothing. In fact, if Big Boss was left to his own devices, he actually would have achieved world peace. That's coming up in the next one. Until then, be sure to check out the links in the description. And if you have any questions, comments, or complaints, I recommend you tell them to somebody who cares. Because I do not.